somewhere on Earth is off to discover Cape Verde, an archipelago of ten or so islands situated in the Atlantic Ocean, 600 kilometers off the coast of Senegal. Ten little worlds whose sole natural riches are their mountains and their deserts, lands of stone and sand, tormented by the winds and currents. George lives on Sao Vicente, just across the water from a couple of uninhabited islands. They are a sanctuary, a last refuge for rare and endangered bird species. George and his brother are committed heart and soul to protecting these secret gardens. Santa Antao is the island mountain. Teo knows the island's every path and trail because he's hiked them all. From the harsh mineral desert to the lush tropical vegetation, this island is a land of contrast. Child of the wind and waves, Mitu is a kiteboarding champion. The ocean is where he lives and plays. He grew up in Sal, and his island has now become one of the world's favorite spots for surfing sports. Sometimes I come here on my own, and there's not a single person. No noisy cars, nothing. And I think this is incredible. This is something money just can't buy. This is natural, and it's mine. It's great. Set down in the ocean, lost out in the vast expanse of the Atlantic, the Creole islands of Cape Verde possess an air of mystery. Up until the 16th century, the archipelago didn't even figure on the charts. And we don't know who really discovered them first, the Arabs or the Portuguese. The archipelago is made up of 10 islands, nine of them inhabited, plus a few islets. Dark volcanic rocks exposed to the waves and currents. Each island has its own shape, its own story. Each one of these worlds is separated from the others by kilometers of open sea, often impassable on windy or stormy days. The inhabitants, so often cut off from each other and from the rest of the world, have learned to rely on themselves. Sao Vicente is one of the most arid of the Creole islands of Cape Verde, a volcanic, barren island with sparse vegetation. Still, George has found his place in life on this island, here where he lives in close contact with the fishermen. These Cape Verdean fishermen who scan the ocean on the lookout for schools of tuna. When I first got here, there was no electricity, no telephone, no cell phones. For years I lived in Cario, on my own, without electric light. But I was happy, because I was part of the fishing community. The most important thing is to be close to the sea, close to the people, and doing your best to help them. Callao, the village where George lives, is surrounded by volcanoes lava and stone cirques that George never tires of exploring. From here, you can take in all this beauty, the wind, the blackness of the rocks, the fishhawks' nests, everything that makes this a, a mythical spot. For many people, the Viana volcano is even a mystical spot. A lunar volcanic landscape. Here on Sao Vicente, where George lives, it never rains, or almost never. It's a stark island, 
that vibrates with raw, wild beauty. Only the skies that blanket it know where it is. From afar, you'd think it were uninhabited, abandoned by mankind on account of its extreme hostility. From his house, George can see the island of Santa Lucia in the distance. With only 35 square kilometers, it is one of the smallest of the Cape Verde Islands. It's also what gives George's life meaning. Santa Lucia is one hour by boat from Sao Vicente. An hour in good weather, because when the sea gets rough, the channel becomes impossible to cross. As a child, George would watch the fishing boats making for Santa Lucia full sails ahead. That's when the island became a dream for him, like a promise for the future. When George was 15 years old, he finally did go to that island with his parents. When he first set foot on this land, he was wonderstruck. Yet he had no idea that this little scrap of land would play a major role in his life. Santa Lucia acts like a magnet to seafarers. Some have even tried to settle there, to raise cattle, in vain. Too far from everything, lacking water and resources, one by one, the settlers vanished. The island had gotten the better of them. I can't find any work on land. So I have to turn to the sea. There are not a lot of fish, but I have a family to feed. So we fish every day. And we catch a few each time. We didn't get much today so far. This is a good spot. There are fish here. So we fish this area for four, five, six days. Then we head back. This is our livelihood, how we put food on the table. They're counting on us back home. We all sleep on Santa Luzia, even if it's cold, and even if we're getting rained on. As it has always been, in the evening, the fishermen find shelter here on the beach of Santa Luzia. They'll sleep right on the beach. It's such a pleasure to be here, far from everything, with no telephone, no electricity, with no news of the world that's in such a state, all topsy-turvy. 
far from the political wrangling. This peace and quiet makes you feel as if you were on another planet. Santa Luzia is completely separated from the troubled worlds of Africa, Europe and Asia, with the wars and famine. Here, you're in a cocoon, and I like to savor those moments. This is a great place. I leave the island on Saturday and I come back on Monday. And it's always a pleasure to come back here. I especially like it when the sea is calm. There's a nice beach where we can land, and it's a free space. But it rains sometimes, and that's too bad, because things are harder then. But usually there's no problem. I've never left this place, in fact. It's my life, you know. Silver is the skipper of a fishing boat. He's one of those sailors who has learned how to live with the sea rather than buckling under to it. And he does devote all his time to it. The fishermen patch their sails with rice and flour sacks. We try to use the sail as much as possible, rather than the motor. The best sacks are the blue ones. They last a good three years. The white ones, on the other hand, no more than six months. Sometimes you just have to redo the sail completely. Otherwise, little pieces keep ripping away and you lose too much time patching it. As soon as the sea is calm enough, George sets out to meet his brother, Zay. This morning, he'll pass by the island of Santa Lucia and head for the outer reaches of the archipelago towards Razo, a tiny islet cut off from the rest of the world. That's where his brother, Zay, a rabid nature lover, comes to stay several times a year. Now they are both wholly dedicated to protecting this timeless spot. George is proud of Razo. Thanks to the efforts of the two brothers, this zone has been declared a protected area, a closed reserve for rare animal species. It's the refuge and breeding grounds of an endangered species found nowhere else, the Cape Verde shearwater, known here as the Cagara. A practice of the Eating Kagara chicks is a custom that dates back to the 19th century. From the time when ships, Portuguese caravels, would sail through here, the sailors of the time would eat these birds on their way out to India or to Brazil. It's an old custom. It's difficult to change people's mindset. To its great detriment, this bird has the reputation in sailor's lore of being an aphrodisiac, like rhinoceros horn or shark fins, and of curing certain ailments. George is fighting these long entrenched beliefs in order to save the sheer water. Meet Zay, George's brother. He has come to check on an Alcatraz chick, another species that, thanks to him, continues to flourish and fly.
On these few square kilometers of land, Zay enters into a different dimension. When I touch one of these birds, it's as if I were touching God. For me, they represent God. It's something that's very difficult to explain, because what I feel is a connection with the very forces of creation. For me, it's like touching God, life itself. The battle these two brothers are waging seems to be turning to their favor. The colonies of birds here are growing each year. This cagara that Zay's banding flew here from Argentina to lay one single egg. It was wounded when Zay rescued it. He fed and cared for it. These birds eat only raw fish, so every day Zay had to chew up whole fish and regurgitate them into its beak. How much money do I make with this work? Zero. Nothing. But what I earn is in my heart. The supreme satisfaction is to nurse a dying bird back to health. The joy of rescuing a bird that's dying and then to see it fly off again. It's worth all the gold in the world. At that moment, nothing on earth can match the happiness I feel. Coming into Razo, there's nowhere to beach. So George moors his boat and dives in to meet his brother on this island of birds. Working together is really fantastic. We grew up near these wild islands, Santa Luzia and Razo. Our parents passed on to both of us their love of nature and the desire to protect it. Being together here today on this island makes me feel so happy because we have a common goal. We're trying to pass on our determination to preserve this spot. And the work has to go on. George and his brother have brought this very fragile bird to Razo, a coruja, a small barn owl. George and Zay rescued it when it was a month old and nursed it back to health. And today they're releasing it. Like any wild animal that hasn't learned from its parents, 
when it hasn't grown up in the wild, when it has never flown like this one here, when nobody has taught it how to fly, I think its chances of survival are close to zero. Go on, go on. This is your big chance. Zay sleeps on the cliff with the birds. He's one of the family. So finish. So I'm happy. 100% happy. No ifs, ands, or buts. Unfortunately, few people attain this happiness, and that's because all their lives they just keep striving to accumulate material goods. Why? I think nature's greatest gift is being able to do something that you truly love. Not for the money, but because you feel good when you do it. There's nothing better. As long as there are men like George and Zay, birds will continue to fly. At the western edge of the group of islands lies Santo Antao, an island mountain, a citadel of steep cliffs. It's one of the highest islands of Cape Verde. The inhabitants here are more turned towards the interior than towards the sea. It's the most fertile island of the group, but up on the high plateau, it's practically a desert. up in a family of farmers in the southern French Alps. His ethnology studies took him to Africa, to Mali, and that's where he first became interested in Cape Verde. It was the music of the islands that caught his attention. Teo has spent the past 10 years exploring these islands, one after another. He fell in love with one of them, Santo Antao. It's dangerous here. I'll show you how to get across. You have to go slowly. It's slippery. When I'm in this type of place, I know it's a bit selfish, but I feel very lucky to be here. In Cape Verde, you fly from Boa Vista, a very arid island, and in an hour you're on Sao Vicente, which is totally different. Then an hour by boat and you're on Santo Antao. You've gone from arid dunes to lush tropical valleys. Santo Antao, you'll find all that on a smaller scale. You walk just a few hours and you're on the arid side, then you pass over wooded peaks, you go down into a lush valley where there's lots of water with banana and coffee and guava trees, and you can wind up on the arid cliffs overlooking the sea and black sand beaches. It's a characteristic of all the Cape Verde islands, and this one in particular because it has such marked contrasts.
Mateo got it right. This island has given him the life that he loves and loves to share with others. These valleys with their rich savors and aromas that descend all the way to the sea are called ribeiras. These trails have been carved right into the cliff face, a long winding series of twists and turns that connects the inhabitants. On Santo Antao, walking is not a pastime, but a necessity. There are very few roads in Cape Verde, so a good part of the population lives at a fair distance from the roads, and many of the valleys, mountains, and landscapes are accessible only by foot. I'm lucky because I've always liked clampering about, ever since I was a kid. And I've always been curious to go see what's over the next crest, what it's like on that peak. It's quite natural for me. These trails all lead to remote villages or a few inaccessible farms. Sugarcane, yams, mangoes, papaya, the people here work the land. They reclaim farmland from the mountain. This is where Maria Tita lives. Over time, she and Teo have become friends. Well, I was born, raised, and married here. My children were all born here, and I love this place. You have the peace, the smell of the water, the calm. It's a good life. The problem is the trail. We're far from everything. I'm happy here, and I'll stay as long as I can. But when I don't have the strength to tackle that path anymore, then I'll have to leave. That trail is really a tough one. Thelma and Marlene have different plans for the future. These two architecture students want to become guides. Teo is teaching them a business full of promise here and a way to share their country. They'll have to learn how to read these steep trails, for none of them is marked. We're on the Planalto Norte, the northern plateau, where the summit is over 1,900 meters high. It's a sparsely populated cattle raising zone. There are only a few herders. It's fairly arid, and it's pleasant here because you don't run into many people. It's a stark mineral landscape with a lot of wind. This is a fabulous spot. You get the feeling of wide open spaces. You feel that there are no limits. It's all very open and you can roam wherever you want. You see this mountain? You follow this path here. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. We're right here. It's marked 1300 meters. Maybe we could cut across here. No, 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 no. No, this mountain is much too dangerous. We don't even try. We have to go this way. Or this way. Here it's too dry. I had a French teacher who would say, freedom doesn't mean having no constraints. It means having the constraints that you like, that you value and accept. That's how it is for me. The constraints of my work aren't really constraints, because it's something I love doing. I'm in my element. I feel free. And that gives me great satisfaction. I really like this stretch because we started out in a fairly green valley, then we crossed a very arid zone and here we are again coming into a totally different landscape with a lot of green grass, crops and water, and further on you can see the beach, the sea. You can experience so many contrasts in a single day's hike. It feels like you're crossing three or four different countries. That's what I like about this island. Mm -hmm. 
I like camping. It's really great. We hiked quite a bit today. We discovered a lot of spots. We were lucky to make it here and to cook some food. Plus, we get to enjoy a sunset like this one. It's just awesome. When I arrived here, there were very few Cape Verdean guides. You could count on one hand. It should be Cape Verdean guides working here in their own country. The Cape Verdeans are very attached to their country. They want to stay here, and if there's a way to do that, then they'll seize that opportunity. What's quite gratifying is that the profession of guide is new here, and it's great to take young people who don't know anything at all about it and to get them started in the right direction. But we can't teach them everything because we don't know it all ourselves. When I see a sunset like that, I want to paint it. It's so beautiful. It really moves me. It's stunning. I want to capture it forever on canvas. Theo, Thelma and Marlin are coming up to the Tarafal Valley. Not too long ago, this corner of the island was completely isolated, forgotten, more easily accessible by the sea than by land. Tarafal is a testimony to the hardships of life here in Cape Verde. All through the islands, there's an ongoing struggle for water. Centuries ago, the farmers channeled the mountain springs to their terraced plots. And thanks to this traditional irrigation system, they can still grow fruit and vegetables today. There's not much land, but we do have water. There are the mountain springs, so they've just built this to grow yams. This is how they irrigate, and it works just fine. This is a mountainous island. The clouds get caught, it rains in the mountains, then the pipes bring the water down to irrigate the valleys below. That's why the valleys are so green. It's striking to see how arid the plateaus are, a real desert. And when you arrive here and you see the deep greens, it's just so pretty in the sunlight, so wonderful. There's no cell phone coverage here. You're isolated, on your own. And if you come here after a hard week's work, it's simply magic. Tarafal is really at the end of the earth. This is Teo's favorite spot. He's even planning to get himself a little fisherman's cabin here. I think the special thing about Cape Verde, aside from the landscapes, the beauty of the country itself, so full of contrasts, where nature is still so unspoiled. The special thing of Cape Verde is its people, full of enthusiasm, full of the joy of living, and with a deep sense of hospitality and generosity that you hardly find in other countries. Or in any case, not the way you find it here. Because these are very often simple folks, but they're willing to share everything they have, even if it's very little two bananas, or a piece of goat's cheese.
The thing about kite surfing is that you're in direct contact with nature. When you put your hand in the water, you touch the water, you feel the wind blowing. And then when you jump, you're suspended in the air. You listen to the wind and the breaking waves. And that is such a thrill. It's my drug. Then after, in the evening, you're so tired. You sleep like a log, and then you wake up to the waves, the wind, and the kite. The island of Sal is in the easternmost part of Cape Verde. It gets its name from the abundant salt deposits found here. Nothing grows here on the island. It's dry, flat, barren, desolate. It was the last island settled because man was not welcome here. The trade winds blow here 10 months a year. They stir up the ocean and seem to want to reshape the island to make it even more inhospitable. In the center lies a desert of dust. The constant winds carry sand from the Sahara and deposit it in this stark wasteland. The inhabitants live turned towards the ocean and the waves. This is the favorite playground of the young Cape Verdeans. Sal, with 350 days of sun a year, the waves and the trade winds, is known as the Hawaii of the Atlantic. Hello. Well, first off, my name is Uteniel George Montero. That's my real name, but here in Santa Maria, everyone calls me Mitu Montero. I was born in Cape Verde, on the island of Sal, and I grew up here. The sea is my life. Kite surfing is Mitu's passion. It's a sport that combines the force of the wind and the power of the waves. Mitu, 28, is two-time world champion, and thanks to that, he has traveled the world. At first glance, kite surfing seems like a simple sport, but it is, in fact, very subtle, an interplay of kite and slipping along the surface of the ocean. Wow, the swell's getting bigger. Look at that wave. I was competing abroad. I was in Peru and in Mauritius. Then I spent some time in Italy, but I wanted to get back to my little island and just kind of chill out. Now I want to hit the waves. For the past four days, there hasn't been enough wind, so I went surfing and did some fishing, but now I'm itching to get back into the water. My specialty is the waves. I use a surfboard when I'm kite surfing. 
So I use the wind. It's my motor to get into the wave. Then I stabilize the kite and I start to surf the wave. I'm doing two sports at once, kiting and surfing. For me, kite surfing means freedom. You're out in nature, you're listening to the sounds of the sea, the waves, a fish jumping. There's nothing else like it. It's total freedom. I think this is simply paradise. It's hot, you can get the sun, the water's warm, you have the wind, the waves, all the conditions in the world right here on this little island. I don't have to take a 10-hour flight to get to a spot, fly two hours for another spot. Here, within five minutes, I have the best conditions in the world. Africa is that way. You hit Senegal first. Europe is that way. And Brazil is over in that direction. There you have it. Surfing sports a lifestyle that draws the enthusiasts together, whatever their culture. When Jérôme landed in Salle 20 years ago, he realized right away that this was where he would be able to live out his passion for the sea. Jérôme is now MeToo's surfing partner and no longer a stranger on these lands swept by the trade winds. He was one of the pioneers of surfing in Cape Verde, and he never left. Like many, he was spellbound by the raw beauty of the islands. It's really wild, perfect. You have the sun, the water's beautiful, and even at this time of year, it's still warm. This is gonna be just great. When Jerome arrived here, he was a windsurf instructor. And he's the one that gave me my first windsurf board. He's a great friend, and we go surfing together. We do all these sports together. Hitting the water nearly every day is like a daily baptism for me. It's a necessity, a very deep passion. You always have to be ready to fulfill your passion, because if an opportunity presents itself, you have to be there to seize it. It may not be there tomorrow, and we neither, for that matter. <laughs> The island of Sal was totally unknown in the 1980s. A few surfing and windsurfing buffs who just happened on this spot found that it had ideal conditions for those water sports. Sun, 
wind, and waves. They were the first to cut the waves in the waters off Cape Verde. Mitu was drawn to the ocean right from his early childhood. When he was eight, he picked up an old abandoned board and set out to challenge the waves. In his hunger for excitement, he went out and learned on his own. Yeah, there's no hassle here, that's for sure. You have the sound of the waves and the wind. That's it. Total freedom. It's too good to be real. It's excellent. When kite surfing came along, it changed Mitu's life. Thanks to him, his hometown, Santa Maria, has become a must on the circuit for surfing enthusiasts of all kinds. Now he teaches kite surfing to the children of his village. But when learning, he instinctively discovered the basic gestures and moves necessary to master this sport. But without technique or experience, it was sometimes a school of hard knocks. Once I took the sail kite and went out on the water. I did a few runs back and forth, smooth as silk, and then the sail collapsed into the water, and I had no idea how to get it back up into the air. So I'm heading out to sea, and the lines are getting all tangled up. It took me two hours to swim back to shore. And when I got back to the beach, I was dead, and I had this huge tangle of spaghetti. I was trying to untangle it for three hours, and I just wanted to take a knife to it. But all that was positive. It gave me experience. It's this experience that Me Too would like to transmit to these children of his island and even beyond. He feels the need to share this school of life with them. <laughs> On Sal, there are no rides or merry-go-rounds, so Me Too introduces the kids to his strange kite. The wind and the waves, that's where I get all my energy. Every time I'm out there kiting or surfing, when I catch a wave, it gives me a charge of energy, and that makes me want to live even more. It's something really good, it's very natural. It's hard to explain. You have to experience it. Sometimes you're in the water and you see this orange sunset, the sun sinking into the water. And sometimes I come here on my own and there's not a single person. No noisy cars, nothing. And I think, this is incredible. This is something money just can't buy. This is natural and it's mine. It's great. For me too, the waves have been his road to freedom. Now he has acquired the wisdom of world travelers. And he knows that his greatest riches are right here, on his island in the middle of the Atlantic. <laughs>